Artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Welcome to episode 36. Today's guest is Steve Schwartz, author of the book Evil Robots, Killer Computers and Other Myths, The Truth About AI and the Future of Humanity, published by Fast Company Press on February 9th. Steve is a serial software entrepreneur and investor. He received his PhD from Johns Hopkins University in Cognitive Science, after which AI luminary Roger Schenk invited him to join the Yale University faculty as a postdoctoral researcher in computer science. In 1981, Roger asked Steve to help him start one of the first AI companies, Cognitive Systems. His third AI company, Esperant, became one of the leading business intelligence products of the 1990s. His book both explains AI in simple terms and, quote, why people shouldn't worry about intelligent robots taking over the world and the steps we need to take as a society to minimize the negative impacts of AI and maximize its positive influence, end quote. Let's get to the interview with Steve Schwartz. Steve Schwartz, welcome to the show. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for having me. So you've got a lot of background in practical application of AI. Can you give us a few details about where you've come from in respect of that, your experience, what that journey has been like? Sure. So I started my AI career back in the mid-70s when I was teaching statistics. I didn't know it was AI back then, but the regression and classification algorithms we were teaching were called supervised learning. And in 1979, I was hired by one of the largest providers of horse racing information to take his data and build a supervised learning system, obviously not with neural networks, but it worked pretty well until pretty much every provider of data started doing the same thing. My official AI career really started when I moved to New Haven, Connecticut, where I live now, to be a postdoc in the Yale AI program. Computer science department at Yale had a very vibrant AI program, and we, we thought of ourselves as the world leader in natural language processing. Started a couple of AI companies, actually three AI companies. One went public, although it wasn't tremendously successful. One, we raised a ton of money and ended up selling it. And then a third one that I started that was very successful, but this one was towards the end of the 80s, the early 90s, when AI was out of favor. It was the second AI winter. And that product became one of the leading business intelligent products, but I had to take all references to AI out of the product in order to market it because AI was so out of favor. Since then, I've been a serial entrepreneur, started a number of companies, been an investor in a number of AI companies, and um, now I'm retired and I just get to be a pundit. (laughs) So your book has a certain message, a theme running through this, and can you briefly tell us what the goal is of this book, The Message? Sure. So AI has made great strides from an engineering perspective. Siri answers our questions. Google Translate helps us talk to taxi drivers in foreign lands. Our smartphones identify the faces in our photos. And, you know, self-driving cars uh, even appear to be on the horizon. And that progress naturally leads people to wonder where it will all end. Will AI robots get so smart that they try to exterminate us or turn us into pets or just take all our jobs? People like Tesla founder Elon Musk saying that AI is humanity's biggest existential threat, and that it poses a fundamental risk to the existence of civilization. The late renowned physicist Stephen Hawking had similar comments. In my book, I try to explain in simple terms how AI works and why AI systems are not going to become intelligent enough to have the ability to exterminate us, turn us into pets, or take all our jobs. And my belief is this won't happen in our lifetimes, our children's lifetimes, or or maybe even their children's lifetimes, uh, if ever. And that is definitely getting into a path that might suck the rest of the interview down there. So I want to stay (laughs) away from the gravitational pull of that one for a little while because we may not get out of it. And I'm quite familiar with that, although it is very appealing to talk about. You were mentioning horse racing there and 
Your book includes a little anecdote that I think is revealing about your mentor, and perhaps you could relate that here about his experience in speaking at a betting track. Yeah, yeah. So that was where I he actually got me started with that. So we were at a Roger Shank, who was my who was my mentor. Every year he used to take the graduate students on a field trip to Belmont Park. And he would sit everybody in the grandstands and they'd gather around and he'd give a lecture about how to handicap the horses so they could bet on them. And you'd see the pundits sitting in the grandstands and they'd be laughing with each other, pointing at this guy. What does he know? And one time Roger took out some handwritten notes on a piece of green and white computer paper. And all of a sudden the pundit said, oh, computers, he must know what he's talking about. And they all crowded around to listen to what he had to say. And, you know, to me, that was a great example of uh, what's now called data fundamentalism. I think that's a term that was created by MIT professor Kate Crawford. And I always like to, when I, when I think of data fundamentalism, the first thing I think of is, and hopefully this isn't steering the conversation in another wrong direction, but I always think of people assume that self-driving cars are going to drive better than humans because computers, of course, can do things better than humans. And I think that's an error in people's perceptions and a, uh, a good example of data fundamentalism. Hmm. And we'll get back to that. But I think the anecdote about how when Roger pulled out computer paper, all of a sudden the pundits are like, oh, what's going on? We've got to have a look at this. This speaks this issue of trust in computers that is really important right now. And as you point out in the book, the issues of bias in AI are uh, that implicit trust in computers, but showing up in another way. And that is something where you describe the, the risks that we're facing right now. Would you like to say more about that? Sure. So machine learning programs are always trained on a table of data. So a facial recognition program, for example, is going to be trained on a set of data, images of people's faces. And if it's a name recognition program, those images will have the correct name and they're all fed into the computer. The computer does its thing and learns how to put a name to a face. The problem with all the machine learning algorithms is that they're only as good as the data that they're trained on. And with facial recognition, historically, most of the training data sets were faces of white males. And as a result, the resulting facial recognition systems do much better on faces of white males than they do on women or minorities. And that means two things. You know, one thing, you know, is arguably good for minorities. If you're a minority terrorist and you're trying to recognize terrorists, you have a better chance of slipping through. But what's really scary about it is that if you're trying to detect terrorists, you're going to make a lot of mistaken identifications of minorities, a lot more mistaken identifications of minorities than of white males. And the minorities are going to be detained at the airport and discriminated against. And this has resulted in most major companies pulling their facial recognition software from sales to law enforcement agencies. And that's just one example of the kinds of discrimination, bias, and unfairness that can occur as a result of machine learning systems. It's, it can also happen if you use machine learning systems to make decisions on hiring or giving somebody a loan or really any other application of machine learning. Right. And last time I checked, Google still hadn't taught their image tagging software to tell the difference between black people and gorillas. That was a famous incident about five years ago. And someone pointed out that it had tagged a picture of their friends as gorillas. And obviously that was not intentional, but it was a problem of, as you described, there wasn't enough data to discriminate between those. And so their response was to stop tagging anything as gorillas. Right. And, and yet, as far as I know, that's still where it stands. That's my understanding also. I think the interesting question here, though, is how would we tell when it is good enough? Because it has the potential to be better than us if it's trained well enough on the right data. And at the moment, it's not. We don't trust it. But it's not that far off. I mean, in certain contexts, it does a better job of recognizing faces than we do. You can see through facial hair and masks and disguises in some instances. So it's already in some domains better than us. What criteria should we use to decide that, yes, it's no longer suffering those problems that we had? 
Right, absolutely. And this is happening with most machine learning systems that are making decisions that are impacting people. I think the impetus started with the European Union, where they require any automated system that makes a decision about a person to be transparent and explainable and to be able to show that it's unbiased. So there are really there are two kinds of initiatives that companies are taking. One is to apply a set of explainability tools. So uh, there are tools that essentially can probe these machine learning black boxes and kind of figure out what's happening inside to explain what they're doing. And then another approach is to test both the data and the results for bias. Are they biased against race, religion, sex, and, and other protected classes? Hmm. And explainability is such a hot topic right now. And I wonder how we should do that with AI, because I don't think explainability is a well-formed problem for people. If we take, for instance, the game of Go, because we know what AI can do with that now. And if we ask human players, how do you make decisions? Explain how you did this. A lot of them would say about certain decisions that it boiled down to intuition. They might explain other things after the fact, attach other descriptions to it, but they had an intuition about that. And we train AI to play Go by showing it a lot of games, or in fact, in the case of uh, AlphaGo Zero, having it play against itself until it got better. And that's not necessarily capable of explaining its moves any better than they are. Okay, fine, that may not matter in a game of Go, but now suppose you're training something to decide whether someone gets a loan or not, and you do that on a lot of data sets of people who are really good at that, and you conclude that it's doing just as well. But they may not be able to explain how they were doing so well at that. And what should we ask the AI to do by way of an explanation. Those criteria, I don't think are well-formed. I think most explanations that people come up with are really describing how they came up with an unconscious or subconscious decision and justifying it after the fact. Yeah. You know, I think explainability is going to work better for something like a loan decision than playing the game of Go. Part of that is because it's going to be easier to explain supervised learning decisions than reinforcement learning decisions. But with some of these techniques, like SHAP and there are several others, are pretty good at doing is determining which features or, or which factors that are the most important in terms of the algorithm that the machine learning system is learning. So it might be that a loan decision system comes back and says, well, income is the most important thing that I'm using. And second most important is the neighborhood. And if you come back with those kinds of answers, well, those are red flags right there because those are things that correlate with protected classes. Hmm. Has AI surprised you? It has. In any way, in any ways that is that you can think of where it's done things that surprised you? It has. You know, it, it really started surprising me when IBM wrote the Watson Deep QA program that beat the two Jeopardy champions. That was back in uh, around 2011. And that actually was the impetus for my book. I, I just thought it was amazing that you could get a computer to answer all those questions. And it was amazing. And it was a, a, an amazing feat of engineering. Uh, but I knew, at the, I knew at the time that it wasn't really, there was really no intelligence in there. It was just a lot of clever algorithms that were just matching words to questions. And IBM subsequently published a series of about a dozen papers on exactly how it worked. And, you know, that, that confirmed my suspicion. But then IBM went and marketed Watson as this system that could think like humans and read all kinds of materials. And, and I found that disturbing. That was when I started thinking about writing the book. And then I thought the progress, the AlexNet system, which was able to recognize images or name images as dogs or monkeys or whatever they were was just a remarkable feat. Speech recognition was solved after all these years. Google Translate just overnight in, I think it was 2016 or 17, they switched from a phrase-based translation system to a neural network. And all of a sudden it did really good translations. Yes, so and, it, and they didn't even announce it. Like any other company would be big press release, fanfare parties. They said, let's just wait and see who notices. And yeah. in a, a day, someone noticed and said, this is unbelievable. 
By the way, I used it recently to do the classic translation of the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak into Russian and back, which from time immemorial has, legend has it, has come back as the vodka is strong, but the meat is sick or something like that. And what I got back was the spirit desires, but the flesh is weak, which is perfect. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, kudos. That's amazing, especially considering that there's no other context in that sentence. Right. Now, you never know. They may have made sure that that was one of the training examples. And that brings up so many other things is in particular in relation to self-driving cars. And you were talking about the progress that we have there. And any given situation that you could say self-driving car hasn't been trained on that, the people who program them and say, well, we will train it on that and then it'll be handled. doesn't matter what it is, someone crossing the road on there, uh, walking on their hands, fine, we can train it and then it can handle that. But there are an infinite number of situations that they can't train for. And how many might they need to train for? What's your opinion on the progress arc of self-driving vehicles? Yeah, I think if we can call those edge cases, you know, kind of these one-off cases that are really hard to identify and train a self-driving car. So, you know, you can argue that, well, we don't know how to build common sense reasoning into cars And you might give an example like, well, if you see a ball bouncing into the road, people would slow down because they think a child might run out after it. Well, the self-driving car vendor could say, okay, well, I'll train it so that if a ball bounces out into the road, I'll slow down just in case a child runs out. Well, what if a G.I. Joe runs out into the road? Now, have you trained your AI system to recognize G.I. Joes? Probably not. And never mind just recognizing G.I. Joes. You have that rule in there that you better slow down if a G.I. Joe bounces out into the road. Right, because our rule is toy, not ball, but toy. But toys are much harder to classify. Yeah, and you know, and do we even have a do we even have a rule? Or is it something we we just recognize on the spot based on our knowledge? We just reason it the first time we see a ball bounce out, we say, Oh, that ball must have come from a child. You know, it's not like we were taught it in driving school. What I think is interesting about the progress of AI at the moment is how many things it's doing, which we would previously have thought were the province of humans. And going all the way back to Deep Blue beating Gary Kasparov, Douglas Hofstadter famously said when that happened, my God, I used to think that playing chess required thinking. Now I realize it doesn't. And that wasn't intended to throw shade at Gary Kasparov, although that was a side effect. But he was saying that everyone thought until then that if a computer could beat everyone else at chess, then it would have to be as smart as we are generally, because it would have to be thinking about strategy, for instance, the way that we do in order to win chess. And we discovered that, well, we could win chess without doing that. Yeah. And, and there are so many things that AI is now doing, which I would think were also in that category. We used to think that this would require general intelligence. Now we find that it isn't. Absolutely. And I should have mentioned Deep Blue when you asked me the question before about things that amazed me. It's remarkable how many, all these engineering achievements that have come out of AI, AI has done remarkable things. Um, But the fact remains that every single one of these achievements is a one-off. It's the only thing that program can do. And what's actually happened in every single one of these cases is that the system has learned a one-off mathematical function that can recognize faces or a one-off mathematical function that can translate speech into text or translate from one language to another. Mm. One of the things that you talk about in your book a lot is chatbots. And I came across a conversation with GPT-3 the other day, which I forwarded to you. I don't know if I had a a chance to look at it, but I found it remarkable. And I'll put a link to this in the show notes in that it was a conversation that a developer had with it about, well, a friend of the developer had with GPT-3 about a game that they were developing. And it sustained the narrative for a whole conversation, offering advice and suggestions as well as as any human could. And without making the mistakes that I'm used to seeing of GPT-3 to the point where I was suspecting that it was a fake. And so I Googled to see if I could find any evidence of that And all I found were other conversations that were also allegedly with GPT-3 that were of the same caliber. 
And we know, we can look at all the lines of code of GPT-3, we know there's nobody home inside, we know it doesn't have common sense, but when it can do something that is nevertheless that useful in that kind of conversation, have the goalposts been moved in some sense? You know, I think GPT-3 is so important for the thesis of my book. You know, are we ever going to get to artificial general intelligence where computers really can think like humans? Um, because when GPT-3 can have a conversation like this that sounds so natural, you start to wonder, even though GPT-3 is just trained to predict the next word, it's producing some remarkable conversations. So I did the same thing you did. I, I Googled it. I found those other conversations. And then I found a note from the author or, or a note from the person who put these together. And he indicated that he used a lot of rollbacks. So these weren't start to finish conversations with GPT-3. This was, he'd ask a question, GPT-3 would give an answer. Eh, answer doesn't really make sense. I'll ask the question again and get a different answer. Okay. And that's how it was put together. That makes more uh, sense. Yeah. And, you know, in my view, what GPT-3 is really doing is it's doing a lot of memorization. It's learning some things about language, syntactic patterns, other kinds of patterns of, of what words come after other words, maybe even something like word embeddings, or it's probably learning. But it's probably doing a lot of memorization, and a lot of what it produces is going to be due to memorization. If, if you look at GPT-3 has um, 700 gigabytes of information in its network. You know, that's the equivalent of 140 million Wikipedia articles. I think there are only 40 million articles in Wikipedia. So it's, it's essentially the equivalent of, no, I'm sorry, I said 140 million articles. If you assume that only 10% of what GPT-3 has learned is memorization and the other 90% is other stuff, that 10% is the equivalent of 140 million articles. So when it does something like answer, what is two plus two? It's almost certainly going back through its set of memorized data and finding somewhere where somebody asked the question, what is two plus two? Right. And, and using it's that. like the autocomplete function on, on your phone or your email where it suggests the next word to type. It's just a very advanced version of that because it can go back through more context than your phone can. Right. And, and those are based on language models, just like GPT-3. In fact, I believe Google uses a language model called BERT. There's a whole bunch of Berts, whole as bunch I understand of it. Um, Sesame Street has a, a, a lot of influence in Silicon Valley. With all of this hype, and the hype is definitely at a peak here, and, and all of this interest, but all of this fog of trying to understand AI and being so difficult to understand it clearly, what are the kind of risks for investors, people that want to evaluate some new AI company to see, should they put money into it? Should they use its products? What, what sort of advice do you have for them? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, and I do a lot of startup investing. I'm a member of uh, a couple of angel groups, including uh, New York Angels. And we see a lot of companies that use AI technology. In fact, it's rare to see a company that doesn't claim to be based on AI technology. And my advice to investors is not to be dazzled by the use of AI technology. I try to explain that, well, first of all, from a technology perspective, a lot, of what the, a lot of what companies are doing with AI has been done for 30 or 40 years with what used to be called statistics. You know, most of supervised learning is either regression or classification, which we've been doing for 50, 60, 100 years. We just can compute much more complex functions now using deep learning, uh, deep, a deep learning form of supervised learning. So number one, don't be dazzled. But number two, don't start with the technology. Start and evaluate the company just like you would a regular company that didn't have AI technology. Look at the business problem, the market, the distribution strategy, the, the valuation, the team, and then look at the technology last to see if it really provides a competitive differentiation or a, a moat for the company. But that's the last step. We'll be finishing the interview with Steve next week, of course. You can find Steve at www.aiperspectives.com and his Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn handles are in the show transcript. Steve's anecdote about Roger Shank's experience at the racing track reminds me of 
part of Hubert Dreyfus's book, What Computers Still Can't Do, where he was attempting to prove that artificial general intelligence would never be possible, using an example of how humans can handicap horses and jockeys by using information that wouldn't appear to be relevant to their performance until the right context is established. He says that, quote, There are always other factors, such as whether the horse is allergic to goldenrod or whether the jockey has just had a fight with the owner, which may, in some cases, be decisive. Human handicappers are no more omniscient than machines, but they are capable of recognizing the relevance of such facts if they come across them. And then he quotes Charles Taylor on the same topic. Begin quote. The jockey might not be good to bet on today because his mother died yesterday. But when we store the information that people often do less than their best just after their near relations die, we can't be expected to tag a connection with betting on horses. This information can't be relevant to an infinite set of contexts, end quote. So you can see where he's going here. How can you be expected to program a computer to put together facts that could range over everything that it could possibly know about the world, some of which may be relevant somehow in some contexts? to the goal of figuring out the best horse. Now, that was written quite a while ago. So what do you think? Is AI still bound by that limitation? Or do the modern large-scale neural networks like the GPT class of transformers that have swallowed Wikipedia and large parts of the internet circumvent it? Are they able to make associations at that level of peculiarity? In today's news, ripped from the headlines about AI and prompted by my discussion with Steve about self-driving vehicle object recognition, researchers at Israel's Ben-Gurion University of the Negev have been experimenting with phantom images to trick autonomous vehicles, tricking the cars into seeing something that isn't really there. They previously revealed that they could use split-second light projections on roads to successfully trick Tesla's driver assistance systems into automatically stopping without warning when its camera sees spoofed images of road signs or pedestrians. In an October 2020 article in Wired magazine, they reveal they found they can pull off the same trick with just a few frames of a road sign injected on a billboard's video. In other words, those Electronic billboards that you see on the side of the road, if someone hacked one and caused it to display a road sign just for a few frames, too briefly for a human to notice, the car, and they did this with a Tesla and also a mobile eye system, would think it had seen a road sign. Now, the billboard in their demonstration was relatively small and placed lower than typical billboards would be, but it's worth noting that the systems they fooled did not have LiDAR. And an AV architect at GM's cruise division said that a LiDAR car would not have been tricked. Of course, LiDAR is one of the ways that GM establishes a competitive difference between them and, for instance, Tesla. The researchers came up with a system they called Ghostbuster that they said would be able to tell whether a car was being tricked the way that they did, although they conceded that Ghostbuster isn't perfect. Next week, we'll conclude the interview with Steve Schwartz. Until then, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, It's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Crisis of Control and see more videos and articles at AIandYou.net. That's A-I-A-N-D-Y-O-U dot net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening. 